Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the July SJAA um, imaging uh, meeting. And tonight we have Jerry Savage, who's going to show us his uh, home observatory, the Stanford Faculty Observatory on the Stanford campus on Jerry's roof. So with uh, no further ado, take it away, Jerry. Okay. Uh, and uh, let me try to get the Zoom screen share working. Okay, and so let's see if we can get this slideshow. Okay, so um, what the title of the talk is, uh, this an urban automated observatory, the evolution. And um, I gave the same talk, not the same talk, but the, a kind of a, the beginning of this talk, I guess now three years ago. And so uh, we're talking about, you know, does it make sense to uh, update the talk and say what's happened? In a sense? And I, I, I didn't think it was, to tell you the truth, initially. I thought, well, it's all the same. But then suddenly I realized how much the field has changed in just three years and how much things have changed in this observatory. And uh, I think a lot of you are living through these, some of these same changes. So I thought it might be interesting. And since I've been so heavily involved in the actual um, mechanics of the observatory, uh, those technical issues, I think, become interesting to a lot of you. So the first slide is the urban problem. And you know this is the light pollution that we have. And uh, San Jose is the white spot down at the bottom. But Palo Alto, where I live, is not good where that little spot is. And so it's a, it is a problem for us to try to do astrophotography in this uh, kind of setting. And my solution initially when I started with this was to do narrow band imaging. And um, the Sharpless collection of objects is a collection of 313 objects uh, originally uh, discovered by a naval observatory person in the 1950s. And I think this was, a, they were initially uh, discovered with prior to hydrogen alpha filters. I think they were discovered with red filters probably, but they are objects that are around essentially hydrogen gas around the edge of the Milky Way. So um, they stand out. This one I call the red A or the scarlet letter. And um, uh, this one got published in astronomy magazine of all places. Uh, and so per people lurk around and look at these objects. I, and, and I started out like a stamp collector, starting taking one then taking another and taking a third one. But they're all eminently elig eligible for imaging in high light pollution. So they get kind of crazy shapes. And many of the most famous um, uh, uh, narrow band images like the rosette are also sharp, sharpless objects. So if you kind of have the list of them, you're going to hit pretty much every notable uh, narrow band object if you look at them. So anyway, this is one target that you can go after. The other target that you can go after in the urban environment are planetary nebula. And these may not be, may or may not be narrow band but they're bright and they'll burn their way through the light pollution. So on top of that, 313 uh, sharpless objects, I went after uh, the ABLE objects. And I think there's 83 of those. I can't remember right now, but these are all kind of like this and they're cool looking. Uh, and so they're also eminently elig eligible, but the problem is they're pretty small. So you can't, you know, you can't um, image them unless you have a long focal length scope. So the outline of the talk is, I've presented the problem. Now then I'll present a little bit of the history of what I've been up to. I'll give you the system overview as, a, as kind of like as a systems engineer would look at it. And then I'll talk about the hardware, the software that's involved and the image processing. So here's some history. Now, Rob will remember this picture. So in uh, 
over 10 years ago, I started with a gift mead uh, refractor. My wife, my mother-in-law got sick. My wife is French. So she went off to France to take care of mother for six months. And I was left to my own devices. And a friend of mine gave me this telescope that couldn't work. So being somewhat mechanically oriented, I finally got it to work. And I stuck an iPhone on the end of it, and I could take a picture of the moon. I said, gee, that's cool. So the first thing I purchased was a C8, a Celestron C8, and put it on an Atlas EQG mount in my backyard. And lo and behold, I could see things, and I could stick my Canon camera on the end of it. So I said, oh, this is cool. But, you know, it's a C8, and it's not really top end. It's a good scope, but it's not, you know, what I wanted. And I said, I was into the I decided I was going to go after the sharpless objects at that point. So I bought a used Takahashi 180ED. And I'll show you a picture of that. That's an astrograph. It's F2.8. Rob has heard the, 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 the horror stories of collimating this thing over the years, but it's a very narrow, uh, it's a very fast scope. So it's very good from that, but it's a wide focal length, about 500 uh, millimeters. So it's wide angle. So it can only take pictures of big objects. Um, so I had poor visibility due to my tr trees in my backyard. I had put this uh, tack onto a, um, a pier, a little bit like what High has set up is like in his backyard. Like he showed me a picture. But I have so many trees, I couldn't see a thing. So I said, could I put it up on a roof, on my roof? So I had a um, one of my colleagues, son is an architect, an engineer. And he said, well, I don't know. You know, you, you might have to pour a concrete pier to reinforce it because the roof is shaky. But then I came up with the, the realization that in my Eichler, there is one main roof support, which essentially carries much of the weight of the roof. And that thing is like a rock. So without uh, an engineering degree, I decided I was gonna try to mount the Takahashi to the top of the roof support on the roof. Because you see, one of the big problems with putting an observatory on the roof is that the roof shakes. So you're screwed you're never going to get a stable image. However, if it's the main support, then it might work. And what people have done, what the architect had suggested was that you pour concrete around the support so you make kind of a pier. But that goes up, that's got to be big and heavy. And it didn't pass the aesthetics committee review. So that was not going to happen. So we'll see what happened. Then I got this, this stable mount. Rob came down, took pity on, Rob was, I know Rob for, for a while. He took pity on me when I tried to process some of my images at one point and showed me what to do. And he had an RC-10, which you can see a picture on there. So we put that up on the mount. I tried to put a 12 inch mead up there. One of my friends who's a real expert who finally collimated the Takahashi the way it should be collimated. He actually took the mirror out of the back with a rubber mallet, I kid you not, washed it off in detergent, tapped it back on, put a laser to it, and it was collimated. You know, it was, it was, it was amazing. But it was still wide, so wide focal length. So in 2019, I got a stellar view refractor. I had enough of mirrors at that point. I had had enough. And so the stellar view uh, is 180 millimeters and had a focal length of about 900. So that would see bigger objects than the Takahashi at, uh, at uh, 500, but it was not such a long focal length that it would be tricky for a lot of other reasons like guiding and finding guide stars and so on and so forth. So. Um, Anyway, so my this was part of so in 2023, that's this year as far as I can tell. 
um, I noticed that I had a do problem with, with the stellar view that screwed up the lenses. And I'll explain that to you in a second. And so I said, shit, what am I going to do now? But uh, they took pity on me at Stellar View. One of the reasons why I bought this scope from Stellar View is that they're on Highway 80. And I can show up at their door with a with the scope and say, what's wrong here? You know, so and the, so that so but I couldn't wait. And I said, OK, I'm going to buy a C11. For those of you who don't know, that's a Celestron C11, 11-inch uh, refractor and a uh, re reflector. And that has a focal length of 2,800. Rob counseled me. He says, you'll never get it focused. That's what Rob said. Uh, but I said, I'm so stupid that I'm going to try it anyway. And there's a guy on Astro Bin named Gary M, who has a Mach 1 mount and has the C11 edge. And his images are to die over. So I asked him, I said, can you, are you really shooting those images off of that Mach 1? And he said, yes, I am. So I said, okay. I plucked down the money. And while the Star Review was in the shop, I bought the C11. I think it was Christmas or something like that. I had an excuse. So I got the C11. So this is part of my, those of you who don't know what I do for a living. I'm a psychiatrist at Stanford, and I'm the geriatric psychiatrist there, okay? So I run the State of California Alzheimer's Disease Center on the campus. And so part of the thing about cognitive aging is to remain agile, cognitively agile. So this is my mental agility program, my astronomy program. So the C11 fit right in, and I could take a I could take a prescription for it and justify the cost. So anyway, so here's the top. It's a it is a cute scope, isn't it? I mean, you can tell these things from about 100 yards away, and so it's it's the same design that they've had now for 20, 30 years. So there's a mirror down at the base, and it comes in the front end, down to the base. And there's a secondary mirror that bounces it up to the camera. And on the secondary mirror, there's a big lens uh, as a focal reducer. So the combination of all of that results in F2.8, which is very fast, and results in a critical focus zone of 17 microns. So if you're going to try to get that thing focused, it is with with no, with good stars in all corners, it just is not easy. So if you look at the base of that thing, you'll say, so what did I do? This is done by skilled Lithuanian craftsmen. You see the bolts. Those bolts are driven down into the um, main support for the roof. And I figured that I needed some inertia so I poured 100 pounds of concrete around it. So you can see it's a foam roof. So that was like, and so it's like a rock. And I put on this thing, the pier is made by pier tech, which raises and lowers the scope. So you'll see the roof, the roll off roof that this is attached to in a few seconds. But I put this up there and I was just saying my prayers because I had no idea whether this thing was going to work or not. And you'll see in the background, how do you get to the roof when you're 70 years old? You need a hatch. You need a way, way to get up there. So I saw that thing in Australia one day. And I said, oh, boy, this is the way to get to the roof without a ladder. OK, so waterproofing the roof is not easy. I have a friend who's in the roofing business who showed me the thing, how to do it. And I'll explain that to you if anyone wants to know about how to waterproof these things. It's not easy, but we'll get into it. So here's what the roof looked like. It came on a, on a flatbed truck on these pallets. And you look at it and you say, did I pay that for this? You know, and, you know, that's the way it looked like. So I had my handyman um, 
One second, Jerry. You, you, I don't think you mentioned the brand. Oh, it's PeerTech is the same company. Right. So it's a PeerTech. PeerTech roll-off roof and oh. PeerTech Peer. Right. They started with the peers, I guess, and Thank then they moved to the roofs. But the two are together, and it's a big company. So these are professional-grade observatories. This one here is exactly, uh, I believe it's six feet by six feet, by six and a half feet. And code is six feet by six feet by seven feet to need a permit. Okay, if you follow that. So I never had to make a per get a permit to put this thing up there. I could have just seen getting a permit on the Stanford campus, right? I'd still be trying to put the thing up there. So I, as, we, as we say, it's easier to ask forgiveness than to ask permission. So I just put it up there. Okay. And so um, my handyman, whose uh, heart is made of gold, helped me with this thing. And um, we put it together. So I told you about the stable mount. So the get, how do you get to the roof? This, this hatch in the back, we're going to show you this. To waterproof it, the roof has to sit inside a, a sill. So it's like a metal thing that the roof sits into, we, it was not done that way at this point. We had to lift the roof up and put it inside a sill to get it to be waterproof. So now you're, you've all been waiting for this. So here's the Hollywood, uh, this is how I said, I should make a movie of how this works. So here we go, it's my, my den, my den. The engineers in the audience will love this. So that's made in Holland. And it is a piece of engineering. The, the Dutch use these, to, they're small houses, and they use this to get to their roofs and decks to expand their living space. So that was the concept. So if you have a flat roof, your house like an Eichler, this is made for it. Because then you can get up to your roof without any problem. And, you know, you're all set. So now here's the, you see the roof. So here's the, this thing now and um, you'll notice down at the bottom of the uh, thing you see this this air here air gap it's at the bottom of this thing you didn't see that before in the previous picture well what my friend the roofer said was the only way to make this thing fully waterproof is to put it inside like a sill so there's a metal edge that's on the inside so that whole thing is resting on a metal sill that if anything drips on it, it drips into the sill and goes outside. So that was the only way I finally could water, be sure that I had this thing waterproof. So anyway, what's it look like in operation? Let's see. That's a recording. Stars here. The red, the red paint at the bottom is to keep from tripping over the Cool or what? So you, you look at the engineering. I think it's worthwhile paying for someone who figured out how to roll this sucker off and have it balanced like that. That's the C11. So there's no supports on the other end? The, nope. the roll-off roof doesn't roll out the supports? The panel for the roof.
Black. Oh, I'm going to close. Hmm. Oh, it's a computer system with all of the do protection for the computer. And then uh, this is the back business end of the telescope, the weights and all the rest of the toys here. Yeah, that's a Zoe 6200 on the back of the camera, which I got from the Stellar Wheel. Oops, we got to go to the next one. So then this is the computer side. I'm trying to give a little bit more detail of what the control system looks like. This is what it looks like when it's bracketed down for the night. You gotta watch out for the dew. And then this is the Mark One and the scope. Jerry, can I ask? I'm surprised you have a computer in there. Uh, oh, is that yeah, historical yeah. or uh, like I would have guessed that you would be in your living room controlling it, and then if you needed to be up there to polar align or something, you'd you know bring oh, no. a laptop you or gotta something. Have all the U everything on this thing runs on USB. Well, so I okay. I meant a display. Oh, the display is down in my office. I'm the one I'm talking to you on now. I I remote access. Yeah, that's so what I, I run everything from my office here. Right. So that display is sort of historical, like you wouldn't. Yeah, yeah that's just if I'm up there, I need a display. Okay. But down here, I run everything from this office where I'm talking to you. I have a, uh, thanks to Mark, I have a BenQ monitor. Another gift. So let me play that again. That's the uh, peer. Um, and we'll we'll go back to that. Oops, let's go back and play this thing again if I can. So there's the pier, and you push it, a controller. You see how it goes up? That is stable enough so it will not lose polar alignment as it's a it's a it's a rock so that's into the concrete into the bolts into the roof support and then this thing is rigid the little d is down right so you want to make sure that it's down low enough so that it doesn't get hit by the roof when you close it and the I don't know why I'm looking at that, but it gives you some idea of how heavy it's built. Um, and then that's back to the controller here. You can control the roof and the pier from this same thing here, this controller. So this is an, uh, so in other words, that has remote control for both the pier and the roof. Uh, but since I'm afraid of being too electronic, um, Bob Denny can counsel me. Don't try to make be too smart with this thing. You'll crash your you'll crash your scope. So so anyway. So let me just stop for a second here and show you the way the system works. Then so you've seen a picture of it. So. What the heart of the system, electronically, computer-wise, is this stuff in bold here, this astronomy control program, ACP, which is made by this guy, Bob Denny, who's a really very nice guy. He's in Mesa, Arizona. And Bob is the person who developed ASCOM, or astronomy communication. So that is the language that allows various astronomy software 
programs to talk to each other so that they can communicate and go back and forth and send data back and forth so that a focuser is going to know what the camera is doing and the camera is going to know what the focuser is going to know is doing and both are going to know what the mount is doing so they can query each other and get information from each one and then take appropriate action. So then if you look on the right over, I'll see if I can use my, my mouse. So on the right in red are ASCOM compliant software. So starting off at the top, you have an ASCOM compliant cloud sensor which communicates with the roof control and the lens cover. So if you shut down everything, it will shut down the roof and the lens cover. Then Maxim is the software that's used for the camera. And that, and when I wrote this first, it was an SBIG 8300. Rob had the same camera. And then I moved to an ASI 6200 on the advice of various people. Go, go CMOS, and I haven't looked back. Um, and the 6200, if you're not familiar with it, is a very large sensor camera. That is uh, 9,000 by 6,000. It's a big one. It's the same as the 2600, except twice the size of the sensor. Okay. So Maxim controls the camera. Then you go down to Focus Max that does the focusing. On the Stellar View, I had a Nightcrawler focuser rotator. Uh, on the C11, I switched over, I went over to the dark side and I bought a Zoe cheap focuser. Um, and I don't look back on that. That just weren't, turned out to work. And then finally, the Astrophysics Control Center controls the mount, the Mach 1 mount. So that's what does polar, allows you to do polar alignment and tracking and guiding and all the rest of that stuff. So all of those things there go back to the astronomy control program. Now, on the left side of the diagram is this thing, expert scheduler. So I told Bob Denny that he should call expert scheduler AI. And at the next time he gave a lecture at AIC, he called it AI. I thought that was cute because what it is, is it's not really artificial intelligence, but it is a flexible algorithm for scheduling. And it uses, it learns what the best. So it is in a sense, machine learning. It optimizes on the basis of your past performance, what would be the best targets for you to use during your individual imaging session. And that is done by a thing called expert scheduler. So in expert scheduler, you schedule the, ob the objects you want to look at, like those sharpless objects. You set the minimum horizon for them. You set the minimum uh, moon um, uh, exposure and things like that. So that if the object is nowhere, is not in that window, it's skipped and it goes on to another object. If that's not in that window, it's skipped and it waits till the best object shows up. So it optimizes, but it optimizes the objects every night for your observing list on the basis of those parameters. So every night you get a new observing list and in the middle of the night, it changes its mind because some object may be missed, all right? So it says, okay, I couldn't get that one. So I'm gonna go on and try this one. It's very, very, it's smart. Uh, and so it also does the startup and shutdown. So right now, what is it? It started up, I hope. And it starts up two hours ahead so that the observatory 
gets temperature equilibrated to the ambient temperature. Then down below, you see the observing list, and then it sets up its priorities. Hey, Jerry, can I ask a question? Yeah, go right ahead. Uh, to you say it it starts up a couple hours early to get the temperature equilibrated. Do you, all, all it can do, right, is open the roof, right? Is that yeah. what you mean? Okay, so that's what I you mean. I just heard the roof open, by the way. Okay, so you open the roof and that helps the temperature adjust, but you don't do anything else to help the temperature no. adjust. Okay. That's much better than having the thing closed down because that can be like a hothouse. And sure. I, and you, I don't know if you noticed it, but I have it insulated on the inside. I have ventilation in it, all the little toys. And 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 by the way, you know, uh, I had an electric train set when I was a child. I can assure you that if I had not had an electric train set, there's no way that I could have put this uh, observatory uh, together. So now the evolution of the system, okay? So the dew damage, I think Rob and Mark have seen the dew damage. So what happened was in the parking of the scope, the stellar view, it was facing upward. There's different parks positions in astrophysics. And so I was made, I parked it in a position that made a perfect cup for collecting dew at the bottom of the lens. Well, you know, I thought that was a nice place to park it. It was pointing at the at the pole star, and but there's a flat down parking. When you looked at that C11 that was in there, that's in the parking position that it should have been in horizontally, because then the dew, if it's going to go anywhere, it's going to drip down the side of the lens, not to the bottom of the lens. So anyway, so it was nicely repaired, but I wanted to move on. So I mentioned I'd, I'd run out of sharpless objects. The brighter, larger planetary nebulae were done. So Gary M convinced me that I could do a C11 with a Mach 1. I used the same camera and I attached the Zoe focuser directly to the screw focuser on the C11. Again, being dumb. Now you can put a moonlight focus or a fancy focus or on it like I have on the stellar view. However, that adds another piece to the collimation, to the image train. So I decided I would do an experiment. I've been burned so many times with collimation. I decided if this sucker can just bolt together, I am not going to have to worry about collimation. And it turned out I screwed in the camera with, I, 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 I went to zero on all the screws. I screwed in the camera with the stock Celestron adapter. There's an adapter that comes for this camera. And the first picture I took had a flat field, period. I said, holy shit, I can't believe it. And it took me a month to get the stellar view flat. And the, the, the problem is that with that camera that I have, the 6200, that is 6,000 by 9,000 pixels, if it is just the slightest smidge out of perpendicular to your image train, your stars will not be flat. Mark knows this. So that's, I just was just totally blown away. Because with the old one, I had to go through Nina. I had to do, I and I I tweaked it, and I you know got the thing. Oh, it was a nightmare. But I got it eventually done. But it was not easy to do it. This thing just worked. And the other thing was that the cell, the, the, the C11, because it's F, whatever, nine or eight or eight or nine or ten, it has a big bat critical focus zone. I think it's F10. So it's like a whole bunch of microns. So that focus zone gets in there no matter what you do. Uh, so anyway, so that was great. Uh, Steve Brady at Focus Max worked with me with the focuser. 
It was the first time anyone had ever put that focuser on this cap on this scope. And it had backlash. And we figured out how to deal with the backlash. And eventually it just focused beautifully. And I just say one other thing about this. This is again a technical issue. Uh, Steve has figured out how to do the focusing with multiple stars. So for those of you who are familiar with automatic focusing, uh, with a V curve, you're trying to get, you try to get a, a, a star out of focus on one side of a curve, you get it down to focusing to best focus, then you go up the other side of the focus to get it up the other side, and then you do a regression line to figure out where the optimal focus is. So what Steve did was he said, okay, we're going to do the whole field and we're going to check the whole field, the star FWHM full width half max on all the stars or 20 of them rather than just one. So you think about that. That's a pretty smart way of getting the whole field into focus, not just getting one star into focus. So that is, I think, the way a lot of the focusers are doing it now that way. But that's the way I did this one. And it worked. It took a long time to get the right uh, distances, but it worked. And I just also say that in Maxim, uh, Maxim has a, is, a, is a really a, a horrible piece of software. But I have to use it uh, because it's, at, it's the only one that's ASCOM compliant. See, I can't use PhD guiding. I can't use Nina. I can't use any of that stuff because I'm I'm into this ecosystem. It's like buying a Mac. You're in it. You're in it 100%. So Maxim also does it, but uh, I have learned that Maxim is not any good at the at the multiple star um, algorithm. I still use a single star for uh, for guiding. They use multiple stars. So anyway. This is the recent evolution of this stuff. So now this is a picture of expert scheduler. That's what it looks like. And then this is inside the scheduler, the browser. So you look at here, we got a picture of the little ring. And in that, it shows the picture, the uh, uh, we want to call them the sets of images. So um, what we have then, uh, blue, green, hydrogen alpha, so on. So anyway, so and then this has your air mass and uh, other things going on here too. So you can set the horizon you want to use, uh, moon avoid and all the rest of that. So these are some of the pictures I've gotten with it. Uh, not too bad. Some planetary nebula. Okay. And it comes with a uh, like an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, what's this? Preferences, the various things that are available with it. Uh, system status, this is what it's going through now. Imaging definitions, what the schedule looks like in detail. The cloud sensor, that's the, the inside of the box I showed you in the video. The sensor I use now is a little bit more complicated, a little bit more expensive. That's the stellar view in there. Uh, and you see how I had it stupidly pointing up, right? So it just acts like a cup. Uh, that's what Maxim looks like. Then that's what Focus Mac looks like. I put pictures in there. And then that's what um, astrophysics control center looks like. Okay, 45 minutes or so. 
So then where's the data go? So it goes into OneDrive. Since I'm a Windows operating system, uh, it all goes into OneDrive. And then I can see it downstairs here at my image processing workstation. So that's the system. Any questions about the system while I'm I'm here? Uh, anything? Uh, as you can see, it all hangs together. The red is the ASCOM compliant stuff. Okay, I'll go on then. So summary. I have a question. Yeah, move to. I have. A few more slides. So I moved. And to Jerry, yep. Jerry, there was a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, are you able to run this remotely, like if you're away from home? Yes. So nice. the way I do that is through. Um, I can show you some screenshots later if you want to. Um, I can share my screen from this computer. So I use Google Remote Access. So with Google Remote Access, I have you know, a secure web-based connection. And I can see it, like if I'm on my uh, iPhone, I can use Google Remote Access on the iPhone. I can see the observatory and I can do whatever I, I, it's not easy with your fingers, but I can do, I can like start it up, shut it down, do simple things that way. But normally I don't go up there. I just sit here. So if that thing was sitting at a remote observatory, it would be doing the same thing. The only thing is I haven't got the courage to put it at a remote observatory. Uh, I you know, it's kind of fun for me to play with it. And I like to be able to go up and, and tinker. You know, I'm a tinkerer, you can tell, you know. So uh, my handyman, Salvador, is great. And so he loves to tinker with it too. So he's the one that helped me with the roof, getting it, not the roof, but he was the one who put in the hatch. So, you know, that thing came on a pallet too. Salvador figured out how to cut a hole in the roof and waterproof it. Hey, Jerry, oh. Jerry, when you say Google remote access, do you mean Chrome remote desktop? Yeah, I'm sorry, Chrome remote desktop. Yeah, you're a Google person you know what the right name is uh, it used to be used to be but yeah. anyway go ahead yeah i can show you on we can do a demo of it from my screen if you want to see that i've got about four or five more slides so Thank you. Like summary i went over this with the move to the roof challenges stable pier roll off roof with cloud center the mount Astrophysics Control Center, Mach 1, telescope, several, the refractor, the stellar view, simplified matters. I had a CCD, uh, the NICOR moonlight focuser is a great focuser, but very complicated. Then I went for the long focal length, C11, for small targets, and the CMOS sensor, which is more sensitive. It's 10 times more sensitive. But I love the stellar view. So this, when you buy a stellar view, and Mark knows this, you get a diagram like this of the laser interferometry of your lens, which shows how good that it can uh, essentially split star pictures. And if you look down at the bottom of this thing down at the bottom here, if you've ever tried to defocus your telescope and get something to look like this, Good luck if you get it looking like this. It's 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 quite remarkable. And like if you get this stray number is 0.99. If you buy a TAC 106, you'll get 0.95. Okay. So and that costs more than the stellar view. So I was considering the TAC, but I just had so many horror stories of people who bought them recently. Now they used to be great. So maybe it's a thing is to buy an old one, but the quality control on the Takahashi's is not what it used to be. At least that's my scuttlebutt. 
I'm probably inside, I'm probably irritating someone now. So that's what the Strel ratio means. Um, and then the software summary. So after I, I, I get all that stuff from expert schedule, ACP, maximum, focus, max, and all the rest of it, then it goes into OneDrive. And then the image processing. The important thing in the urban site image selection is I focus on narrow band if I can, the sharpless objects, the stellar view allows also bright planetary nebulae. And with the high resolution of that CMOS, very small pixel camera, and the really quality lens of the stellar view, you get down to some very ridic ridiculous uh, resolutions, particularly with narrow band images. You know, I'm talking you know, like one arc second resolutions. I couldn't believe it, but I measured it, and there it was. And my processing has, uh, and when I wrote this first slide, this was from the last talk, was 90% PixInsight and 10% Photoshop. And this was my simplified flow diagram in the old days. And believe it or not, that's what I did. And a lot of it was based upon these books. Uh, and I essentially had a flow diagram that followed the chapters of Keller's book and then went through them and made sure that I did everything that he said was the right thing to do. And I got good images. But, um, and I did this for combining, combining all these steps to combine hydrogen alpha and LRGB orange. But now life has gone, I've gone over to the dark side. Now, most of my image processing is with blur, ex I hate to say it, blur exterminator on the narrow band, on, on everything, and then noise exterminator. And I feed that stuff into generalized hyperbolic stretch. Uh, and before you know it, I've got good images. It's, it, it, you know, it really has simplified my life. And you, you, you guys had some wonderful lectures about how to use the generalized hyperbolic stretch. I've been back and forth with it, and it's very good. Now, the way I do the processing, for those of you who are computer jocks out there, uh, with Mark's advice, I built my own computer using a Ryzen processor. And I have the latest Ryzen processor in it. And if you're interested in the parts list, Mark gave me his parts list. I duplicated it. But I have I have one newer generation Ryzen 7950 uh, processor in here, which is uh, 16 cores running at 4.5 gigahertz. Now, one thing that has just you know changed things for me a little bit was when I bought the original computer, I bought a cheap graphics processor because I didn't have I didn't need anything. But one of my hobbies over the years has been aviation. And in my lab, we've had flight simulators. We've, we've done a lot of work on aging and aviation. So what you're looking at here is not the Stanford campus. This is a computer generated image. If it, if it was for real, you'd ask yourself, how could I have taken a picture of that aircraft? And this is just unbelievable graphics processing. And it's the CUDA core processing. So I bought the highest end graphics processor that I could stick on that Ryzen chip, uh, which comes with eight giga, uh, uh, gigabits of internal memory. So then why did I get the CUDA core processor? Uh, because the AI, if we go back to these guys here, blur exterminator and noise exterminator, both can use CUDA cores. They're the only, basically the only thing, and just about the only thing in PixInsight that can use CUDA cores. So they can use the parallel processing of the CUDA cores on the graphics processing unit 
And so at the end of the day, um, how did I know it worked? So I put a time watch to a blur exterminator of my stopwatch to a blur exterminator job. And it took eight minutes, even with the rise in 7950. Because I got that big, I got those big images. It took 20 seconds with the CUDA cores. So it's just, it's, there was no comparison. And noise exterminator, it runs instantaneously. So I would just say that if you're looking for an excuse to buy a good graphics processing card and play video games, um, get flight, si flight simulator and get a good, good uh, graphics processing card. So anyway, so my acknowledgments, my wife, Danielle, and her mother's hip, if my mother-in-law hadn't broken her hip, I wouldn't be into astronomy. So remember, you're in the hand of God here, hands of God here, and it all happens. I appreciate Rob's moral and technical support over the years. Uh, he kind of got me stuck in this business, and I appreciate it. I appreciate Bob Denny's uh, writing expert scheduler and his support over the year. Also, George and Howard, who uh, Rob also knows at Astrophysics, uh, for getting the, mark, the amount of periodic error down to one arc second. A Vicket Stellar View for getting me a good lens. Ray at Moonlight for help with the rotator setup. Steve Brady at Focus Mac for the fine points of focusing. And Gary M for getting me to try the C11 and getting nice images like of that of planetary nebula down there. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop there. And um, I'll see if there's any. Um, questions or comments. Um, and this is, I will show you what the um, screen share looks like on the remote desktop. So this is what you see when the system is actually running. I took a dangerous Thing here is actually to show this in public when it started up. So um, what you're seeing is the software in operation currently in the observatory because it is 8:30, right? So what you're seeing here is the observatory control software running here, and this is the telescope information. A Christmas tree diagram of red and white here, saying the dome is open and the weather is is green. Down here is the script that ran, and it was chilling. I chilled the cool of the, the chip slowly because that camera has a dew problem in it. And if you chill it slowly, uh, it doesn't freeze. Um, so anyway, uh, then the other pieces of software, this is the astrophysics stuff over here. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen it, this is the mount here and the various bits and pieces that astrophysics uh, runs on it. And then this is Focus Max, the temperature and position. Uh, the temperature business is very interesting because you get a temperature compensation curve. So one of the things that's, the problems that I had with this thing was if you focus it, uh, in the early morning, it's cold, right? So it gets to a different focus point than it does in the early evening when it starts up. But if the focuser is at the same point than it was in the early morning when it starts up, your stars are out of focus. And then it can't do a plate solve. So the first thing this thing does when it starts up is it does a plate solve to make sure that the scope is oriented and all the rest. But if the stars are out of focus, it will not do the plate solve properly. So what Steve did was he has temperature compensation built in to the Focus Max software. I think Nina and others have it also. And so that means that you do a temperature compensation curve and you figure out what the regression coefficient is for 
the temperature and your focus settings. So at a certain degree centigrade, like 24, the position of this focuser is 11119er. However, I can tell you that at 12, it's not that. But if it was at 12, let's say it was 1200, when it starts up at 23, it moves the focuser to the correct, or a, a, a fairly close approximation of it. The other thing it does uh, is that as it cools during the evening, it will readjust the focuser for the temperature. Okay. So that's what that's what that guy does. Then this thing down here is Maxim, notorious Maxim. And um, so this controls the camera. And this is the setup, the guiding, and the exposure. Uh, it's, um, what can I say? It's what they use, uh, but it's not, not a lot of fun. This is the power control panel. This is what's called an IP controller, internet protocol controller. So you can control this remotely and change those eight switches here. So you see some of them are, the Christmas tree diagram is um, green and red. By the way, for those of you, does anyone know where the Christmas tree diagram is? In World War II, in submarines, in the control room, they had a Christmas tree diagram for the valves. So when the board of all the valves was green, that meant they could dive the ship. But if it was red, if there was any valve that was open that should be uh, not open, it has red. So that is a Christmas tree diagram. And so this is a Christmas tree diagram, but most of the things are on here, except for my backup and the light. So there we go. So that's the IP business. And then this is my desktop, but if you go over here, this is what you see as the observatory control software overview. So this is what Bob Denny has to run the whole shebang. So if you just see this, so normally if I come in on remote desktop, I go to this. And it's really cool because you look on this thing, you'll see the observatory panel here, which shows the local time, so on and so forth. And you can have multiple schedules. I think when Rob was around with this, we scheduled, Rob could schedule it too. Uh, then the telescope tells what the telescope is doing, the imager, what the telescope imager is doing, the panel, all the rest of it. Then this was the last image that was taken. The guide star shows up down here. And then this is the plan that's being executed. Uh, down below here is the log of what was happening as, as things happened as you started up. And it's really, it's quite cool. I mean, Denny is crazy. He, he did all this stuff. And so on here is the schedule uh, browser. So these are the images that are in my schedule currently. And so you can look, what I've got on here is a lot of NGC things. These are small galaxies now. Now with the C9, the C11, I can image galaxies. I'm not afraid to image galaxies that are only 10 arc minutes across. And I get reasonable images. If you look on Astro Band, you'll, you'll see. So they're nice. And then I still am out there. Uh, Rob and I did the veil way back when. I can't stop doing that one. And then uh, he did a beautiful job of that. Uh, and then these are sharpless objects which I can't keep away from. I've shot these about three times, uh, but I shoot them again with different scope. And now with this one, I'm gonna get more detail because the C11 
is going to get me more detail in those clouds than I had gotten previously. Some of these Sharpless objects are actually small uh, clouds, small planetary nebula. This one down here is an exoplanet. And um, one of my colleagues at Stanford is an exoplanet expert. He has moved on, but he got me into figuring out how to do exoplanets. And I will just tell you, don't try it in the Bay Area. The scintillation of the stars is so bad that you can't really see the transits very well. So, so anyway, so that's the uh, observatory uh, control software. And um, let me just see if there's anything else. I think that's pretty much it there. I'm going to stop the share here because I'm talked out, guys. Uh, and uh, I'll sit back and see if anybody has any questions. I'm going to get a glass of water. Hang on. All right. Um, while we're waiting, um, uh, you know, I I can easily be a backup questioner, but it would be great if other folks have uh, more uh, questions. <clears throat> so when he comes back, I see. I, I have. Great. Yeah, I have one or two. I can. Excellent. There we go. All right. Take it away, Glenn. So I'm interested in the, the planetary nebula. You know, so many of those are, are small, as you mentioned, the, the small galaxies. So you, you're running the, the C11 at its native uh, F10, uh, no, no Barlow or anything. Um, what is your, your arc seconds per pixel? Um, uh, it's three point, it's point three seven, point two seven or point three seven. Uh, it's oversampled. Okay. But um, I was told it's better to be oversampled than undersampled because you can always bin. Uh, mm -hmm. and, um, so if I bin, I, you know, I really haven't, it's overkill. I think it would be probably better to have the camera that like Mark and Rob have, which is a 2600. But I got it, you know, I didn't know what I was doing when I bought it, uh, but I bought it anyway. And I thought it was a good match for the stellar view, but it was overkill for the stellar view also. Uh, but the, there's several people on Astro Bin that have it. And uh, they recommended it. So I did get it, um, but that's that camera. But it is oversampled. Now, the um, the seeing that I can get, um, you know, I've gone back and forth with Gary Emma what you can get out of this thing, and I, you know, you can get, you know, basically arc second viewing out of it, which would be about two pixels. But where we live, you're not going to get that. There's a guy on Astro Bin in Australia that has the same setup. He does planetary nebula, Jupiter, does beautiful stuff. He's way out in the boonies. And he gets, you know, single arc second viewing from that thing. But I will say that um, the C11, I am uh, pretty much totally impressed with the optics. You know, as I said, out of the box, it was flat. Uh, on that big that big camera. So anyway, I think there's a good theoretical reason, probably to bin. Uh, some people two x bin, but uh, Gary does not. Uh, he doesn't bin. Sometimes he does, but uh, I I've been back and forth with this. I had a long debate. Uh, at Astro Bin and uh, about people who have this scope about what the correct uh, binning would be and so on and so forth. And at the end of the day, most people go native uh, one, one to one. So that's what. Glenn, I saw an interesting Thanks. post from Roland Christian on the astrophysics mailing lists who claimed that, you know him, he's the uh, designer at uh, Astrophysics, 
and he his claim was that you know forgetting about seeing for a second you know uh a 150 refractor or so is going to get you as much resolution as anything um of course you're going to gather a lot more light with a c11 than yeah. a one. but well, but in terms of resolution that's about where you max out yeah with the with the mm -hmm. 130 uh one of the other guys uh that i know on astro bin has a 150 uh and um uh mark knows who that is but anyway um i forget his name but the 130 i think is the sweet spot for uh, at least for me for me it was the 150 i was afraid it was a little bit too long a focal length for me but with the one uh with the 130 and you and going to um narrow band filters i could get one arc second i can met and the reason i know that is that i can see the pixels so like the way you can figure that out is you shoot you you know what the pixels are the size of the pixels right so you show you shoot a picture and you blow the sucker up and you can see pretty much what your resolution is because you know that the pixels are a quarter of an arc second across, right? So it's not rocket science to see what, what the resolution is. So I shot a couple planetary nebulae with narrow band that, you know, some of them are, are just RGB, uh, but some of them are narrow band and the narrow band uh, planetary nebulae will cut right through our fog. Or, or whatever our light pollution is. Uh, and so you can get some pretty good resolution with that. So anyway, but for our, I mean, for yeah. our seeing, you know, you know, it's probably right that, you know, 130 is overkill. But 130 is a cool Well, story. I'll give it a, a try. I feel like I'm running out of targets, so yeah. Yeah, well, you see, the thing is, I mean, I got it to work with the C11. And like the, all the bets were off on that thing. I was just happy it guided. But of course, the thing is, I've spent a lot of time getting getting the mount to guide right. You know, so the polar alignment is really precise. And um, so, and the periodic error measurement is. I have a good I have a good Mach one. I have two. I have basically have two waveforms in there, and that's it. And it corrects very well. Some people will have God only knows what their waveform looks like, but I got a good one, and it's it's easy to correct. So the correction I think it, the correction gets down to one arc second. And you can measure that pretty much, you know, in your, um, the way that you can do that is like in Maxim, um, if you're guiding, um, you turn the guiding off and then it will give you what your errors are. And you can still see the periodic error in um, Maxim, but it'll be small. You turn if you turn the error correction if you turn the error correction on, it'll be better. So it's you know you can you can that's the way I learned you can make you can manipulate it by turning the periodic error on and off, and then you get an idea of whether the periodic error did you any good or did you have some harm. I did not get in, in Mac and with uh, astrophysics. This guy Ray, uh, the um, guru Raylick, um, has their modeling uh, that you can do to model the uh, behavior of the scope by taking a sky model with a whole bunch of stars and all that. I did that, and, but I did it, I, and I did the uh, periodic error check with that on and off, and it didn't do anything for me. So I don't think the, the, the modeling did anything, but my periodic error, um, you know, I, I, I think I only measured it five, five or six cycles, but it was just right on. You couldn't miss it. I think one of the things I found was with this stuff is to harass the, the vendors. 
and make sure you don't make sure they know that you know the difference between good equipment and bad equipment. So like the people at astrophysics, I told them that I am two hours away from your doorstep. So don't give me any bad glass. And I, I that's my, that's a quote. <laughs> You're not talking about astrophysics, are you mean? I'm sorry, I'm talking about uh, stellar view. Right. I, I told the same thing as astro uh, to astrophysics. But they're not two hours. They're, they're, they're nice. They're they're nice in astrophysics. Glenn, did you have another question? No, I think I think I covered it. Just well, I've always avoided the the small uh, small galaxies and small uh, planetary nebula because uh, I just didn't think I had the. Oh, you can do it. You just the resolution, but you, you just need to give it time. You know, give it 20, 30 hours. But anyway, <laughs> well, yeah. you know, the thing is, I think it would if you take if you take a look at my my pictures on Astro Bin, you'll see I've got ten years of evolution, all the way back to the C eight with a Canon on it, and I was just so happy mm -hmm. that I could see NGC uh, NGC two fifty three. I couldn't believe it. But it's the worst image known to man. It's like 200 views and one up, one up, <laughs> thumb up, thumbs up. But if you go through some of them on the, um, what was I going to say, on the planetary nebula, you'll see some that are taken with a stellar view. And you can see how I struggled to get them to work. But some of them are pretty good. And, um, they were all done with that, you know, uh, 130 focal length image, mm. uh, imager. So you can do it. Hey, Jerry. If, if you can, the other guy to look at is Gary M. He does all these tiny things, you know, it's ridiculous. Jerry, uh, I had another Hang question. On, check it out. Um, I didn't notice any other cameras like I would have expected. So let me ask you about that. So do you have a camera just pointing at your rig? So, you yeah. know, from the comfort of your living room, you can I see have two. Okay. And then I suppose cameras where you could see what the sky looks like if you don't trust the no, other. No, I don't, I don't bother with that because I have the Scott, the sensor. And okay. they're really expensive, the fisheye view cameras. Uh, but I have, I have a fisheye view camera inside the observatory, which uh, runs, if you want to see it, you've got nothing better to do, I can show you it, but uh, what it looks like. But uh, it's like, um, it, it allows me to see where the scope is and if the roof is open as like a check. Okay. But it doesn't give a great image. All right. I just want to check if other folks had questions of the folks remaining since we lost a few folks. Uh, yeah, I have a question for Jerry. Please. Uh, yeah, um, so Jerry, uh, I was wondering, I, so I may, you may have covered this, I had a little uh, drop out for dinner here, but um, uh, I was wondering uh, with your automation setup, if you automate the entire night's imaging run, including opening the roof and closing the roof and parking the scope at the end of the evening, and whether you have any uh, safety monitors for, you know, three grain storms or whatever to button it all up automatically or not. Yeah, it's, it's, it's completely automated. And um, the, um, it, you know, that's what that software does, that ACP software. It's designed for uh, large observatories. And this is probably the smallest observatory that has that software in it. Uh, and it, the startup script starts it up, starts everything off, and starts the imaging going. The imaging is scheduled by their scheduler that has sort of semi AI in it. And then at the end of the evening, it shuts down. And if there's weather, there's a cloud sensor that senses that and closes the roof. Uh is there any uh, specific sensors and stuff to, I'm, I'm not exactly sure of your setup, but I, I know my little roll-off roof observatory 
um, the scope has to be parked perfectly in order for the roof to safely close. Um, and so my, I've been meaning to automate the opening closing of the roof, but uh, I'm completely paranoid that I could decapitate the scope if there's some screw up and it thinks it's parked, it's not actually parked and, and so forth. So I, I still manually, well, I, I could do it remotely. It's, it, I have a remote um, control of the roof, but uh, I don't automate the opening closing the roof for that reason. So I was wondering if there was, I, I've seen some people use special park sensors that use like little yeah. re, uh, sensors with a reflecting uh, element you put somewhere on the scope so that it won't possibly close the roof unless the scope is in exactly the right orientation. So I'm, I was wondering if you had to deal with anything like that or not. When I first got this system, Bob Denny told me, whatever you do, make sure your scope is fail safe. Uh, with the roll-off roof. And that was like the first sentence out of his mouth. Um, because he's seen these roo these roofs crash into scopes all over the planet Earth. And you can be the, the, the problem is, I, I'm a programmer, right? I've got decades of experience. And you would say, gee, you know, you ought to be able to do that. And you can do that. But how reliable is it? And the problem is that these things seem to have a mind of their own. And with, normally you'd say, okay, the, the scope should park and then the um, roof should close. But believe it or not, in the development of the program, they wanted the roof to close while the scope was parking in case a rainstorm came in and ruined things. So the first thing that goes off is the signal to park the roof. And I went over this with Denny. I, 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 you, you, know, you, you ought to be, park the scope first. And he said that would give you a false sense of security. And I have all that stuff to do that. And I have the equipment to, to, to make sure that that roof will not close. I have it, it that controller that I have, I didn't, you probably didn't, you didn't see the picture, but I have like an industrial strength controller, all designed to do that. And I don't trust it. I just don't trust it. Yeah, that's, that's my situation. Um, <laughs> I, I, I just don't trust it. And so the way I finally decided it was that uh, I have the, um, a scope on a pier that can be raised and then the roof fail safe shut down. So if I really have to raise the, you know, uh, if I if I need to see something low to the horizon, but currently it can see anything that's 45 degrees above the horizon. And you're not gonna see much under 45 degrees. So my scope is always below the edge of where the roof would go when it closes. Yeah, I think that's one of the advantages of a dome is that your your, your scope is always safe. There's no orientation where if, if it, I had to do get... this again, if I had to do this again, I would have made a regular dome. Because the regular dome does not have this problem. The yeah, I, I I simply can't trust the the system to uh, <laughs> not well, listen, I spent a lot of like crush crush the scope. So I I make you know, that it, manual it, operation currently. I spent a lot of money on mine, and I still don't trust it. Nobody trusts them because Denny has Denny knows everyone who has one of these systems, and like the big ones, like I, I don't know. I've never been out to SRI, but they have big you know big big systems with roll off roofs but they're all below the level of the roof you know they're not yeah, if i was doing this again i i would have lowered my my pier uh because i wanted to maximize my horizon so i i have it tucked up in in you know in park position right below the roof line yeah uh in, in retrospect considering i in with seeing glow on the horizon honestly i i rarely i mean in retrospect i wish i would have just had my pier two or three feet lower so that 
the you know pointing at the zenith, I can still close the roof without possible impact. Yeah. Well, anyway, mine is um, you know below the level of the roof, and I never. I don't rarely go below it. I, and the thing is, is that the other thing I've learned is that I feel like an old man now at this, but I've been doing it for 10 years. I guess that makes me an old man in it. But what I've also learned is when you shoot down low at the horizon, you get shit images. And you're going to throw away a lot of those images. So you're better off selecting targets that are up high. And with this C C11, I have a plethora of targets now. There's there's 10 degree wide galaxies all over the place. And you know, and planetary nebulae. So I'll have I'll have targets for the rest of my life that I don't have to go below 45 degrees on. So that's that's the other thought, the reason why I had the got the C11. I also should mention that if anybody wants a slightly used Stellar View 130, uh, you know, I don't know that I'm ever going to put the thing back on there. Mark, it's a good scope, honest, but I, I don't know that I'm ever going to put it back on there because uh, it's like, um, you know, I'm in love with the C11. I need another, I need another peer. I was hoping I could put both on the same pier and then I could shoot both at the same time, but I don't. The, the Mach One won't handle that, I don't think. Anyway, all right. Are there any more questions for Jerry? A hand from Marianne. Oh, yes. You described for us in the beginning how you handle the water situation with the troughs, and we saw the very good insulation inside. Could you describe a bit more about how you handle ventilation for those really hot days or humid days? Is yeah, it a passive probably, system? Probably or? One look is worth a thousand words. Uh, let's go back. Let's see if we can find the, uh, is the picture. Yeah, here, here we go. So, um, Finally, uh, yeah, so I think if I go to this one and I do the slideshow, oops. Yeah, you'll see on the up on the right hand side up here is an exhaust vent. This yellow, this aluminum stuff I taped in there. It's a insulating thing that keeps the temperatures down. Yeah. And I have a a fan. You can't quite see it, but on the equipment shed here, there's an exhaust fan next to the computer. Uh got it. So that exhausts, the, the air comes in through the bottom of this thing and then comes out through that. And then ultimately it all comes out through here. So, um, and you can see the person who was asking me about where the scope is, you see it's below the roof, right? So when it's up, you know, and that's the control panel. Well, oh, that's the, the control panel. So that control panel could handle the peer control also. But um, it, I just don't trust it. It's used, I mean, it's an industrial strength thing, but you know, that's it. So you can see that thing is fairly low, but that's in a horizontal position, the scope. When it rotates, when it rotates up, it's fine. You see a lot. And there's where the computer stuff is hidden. This is the computer system. The computer's at the bottom, and it sucks in air through the bottom there, 
and the exhaust fan it's comes there. out the side, you see. And uh, this is the back business end of the telescope. And the exhaust the fan in the upper left hand corner, and I don't all see the it, rest right. of the toys. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, great, that, thank you. That maybe helps. I yeah. Think. All right, do we have any more questions for Jerry? Yeah. If anybody has any questions, they can just mail me at Stanford. It's just your savage at stanford.edu. I'll be happy to, to uh, give my two cents. Anyway. Uh, yeah, all right. Well, how about if everybody unmutes and gives Jerry a hand? Thank you very much, Jerry. Thanks, good night. All right. Well, thank Good you, everyone. Time. Thanks, Rob. Thank you, everyone. I'll see everybody next month. Yeah. Y'all okay. take care.